I chose to study chemical engineering because I felt that it had the possibility of making a positive impact in the world. It allows you to solve problems, real world problems, using basic sciences, which is what I was interested in. Chemical engineering at Cambridge is so broad, it has the basic science grounding, but then you're free to look at whatever area interests you. We focus on fundamentals, which means that the course is very mathematical and very much connecting the physical sciences together with the practice of chemical engineering. And that allows people to really understand the basics of what they're doing and then obviously apply that to practical situations. The chemical engineering course at Cambridge is a traditional course that will cover all of the process industries and prepare people for careers in those, but it's also developed to include the life sciences. The primary modes of teaching are lectures and supervisions. The lectures in Cambridge are very intense, but they are supported by the supervisions where the students explore the subject really in great depth. We also have a laboratory class uh, where students can do experiments which are then continually assessed and we have um, longer exercises which allow more challenging problems to be done to support the lecture courses. I've always found the environment and atmosphere at this department to be very friendly and encouraging. A lot of support is available both in the department and also in the college. Everyone in college has a tutor. You also get assigned a director of studies. Also within the department, there's, uh, you know, you have supervisions, you have supervisors to talk to about your work. During those, you can ask questions that you have about the course or uh, that extend beyond the lecture material. Getting the first class training through supervisions and lectures really pushes me to, to work as hard as I can. The admissions process at Cambridge is rigorous research the subject, know what you're getting yourself into, that includes looking at the department website and I think Cambridge itself, get a feel for the city, the university, also having the confidence that you're capable of applying for Cambridge. Career prospects for chemical engineers and particularly chemical engineers from Cambridge are excellent. Increasingly students go into an enormous variety of industries. Some graduates go into finance, many go into consulting, whether this is engineering consulting or business consulting. We have students working in the process industries, the chemical industry. We also have students going into banking. We have a number going into um, research projects. Food, uh, pharmaceuticals, water, uh, electronics even. And there is an increasing emphasis on sustainability and clean technology. It shows how fundamentals of chemical engineering continue to be highly important and highly relevant in the changing society. Good morning. My name is Lisa Hall. I'm Head of Department in Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology. I'd like to welcome you all here today for our virtual open day. Chemical engineering and biotechnology is a phenomenally interesting department. Did you know that the fuel cell that took Apollo to the moon was developed in our department in the 50s? Today we're doing work that bridges all of the sciences and engineering and makes the people from chemical engineering and biotechnology able to contribute to all areas of society and be ready for tomorrow's technology. We're especially interested in the global challenges, the global challenges in healthcare and in energy, and looking at where we can take technology for the good for tomorrow. The question to ask is, are you ready to contribute the technology for tomorrow? And by doing a degree in chemical engineering, it prepares you with the fundamentals of 
science and technology and engineering that will enable you to contribute to tomorrow's technology. I would like to introduce you today to the people who will be participating in this virtual open day. Uh, if Patrick, if you would move to the next slide, thank you. So speaking to you next will be uh, Dr. Patrick Barry, and he'll be telling you about chemical engineering at Cambridge. And then Dr. Roisin Owens is joining us from her college room and will be talking to you about applying to Cambridge. And then Nikki and Helen are here to give you the student perspective on what it's like to study chemical engineering in Cambridge. And then we'll move on to questions and answers. So uh, welcome again to you all. And I'm going to pass over to Patrick to tell you about chemical engineering at Cambridge. Hello, uh, my name's Patrick Barry. I'm one of the academics in the department. And I'm going to describe firstly a little bit about what is chemical engineering. And then I'm going to go on to explain how we teach chemical engineering here at Cambridge. So on the slide, there's a picture of the Department of Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology. It's a marvelous new building, opened three years ago, a cost of 65 million pounds, because it's an important area that we really want to develop. And our students are going to be a key part of that. As I go through, you're welcome to uh, enter questions into your questions and answer box. Some of them we will answer as we go. Most of them will keep back until the question and answer session at the end. So firstly, what is chemical engineering? Well, chemical engineers are involved in the production of products, usually chemical products, on an industrial scale because materials are made out of molecules and atoms and chemicals. And so products are usually made out of chemicals and when you go down to the molecular level. And we want to make a lot of them. A chemist may be interested in making one milligram of a marvellous, interesting molecule. Maybe a molecule that cures COVID-19 coronavirus. But if it's, they can only make one milligram, all that can be accessed by is one individual. We want to make not milligrams, but tons or thousands of tons of the products so that thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of people in society have access to those products. So we do need to make things on a large scale and that's the realm of the chemical engineer. So here's my picture of what is chemical engineering. We're going to start with molecules, the starting materials in some shape, or form, and we need to transform them. And so we're interested in making valuable products. And historically, the discipline evolved about the manufacture of bulk chemicals, gasoline, sulfuric acid, ammonia, things like that. It then developed to involve the manufacture of more fine chemical, more speciality molecules, maybe agrichemicals, maybe particular dye pigments, maybe perfumes, molecules for particular applications. And this obviously includes the pharmaceutical industry, where the molecule made is to solve a, a medical condition. And some pharmaceutical compounds are simple, like paracetamol, Others can be incredibly complicated, like uh, monoclonal antibodies. But we need to be able to make them on a large scale so that lots of members of society have access to them. There's a big polymer industry. I, I admit I'm not a fan of single-use plastics, but polymers themselves can be incredibly useful materials for a range of applications. 
You know, they are cheap and lightweight and strong and corrosion resistant and used wisely. They're very valuable. Uh, metals, we need to make metals, often pure metals, but often alloys, alloys with particular properties for our application. There are lots of types of stainless steel, for instance, and that doesn't grow in the ground. Consumer goods is an important area of chemical engineering. What do I mean by that? I mean things like shampoo and toothpaste and washing powder and deodorants and antiperspirant. And there are shelves of supermarkets full of these consumer goods. Well, what are they deep down? Toothpaste is just a mixture of chemicals. And so you need similar types of knowledge dealing with that product on a large scale. Uh, some food grows on trees, but not all food grows on trees. Uh, some is processed in some way. And so as an example, if you see in supermarkets, lots of biscuits available. It's quite easy to make biscuits in your own kitchen, but can you make 100,000 biscuits, all of the same shape and size and texture and color? And that's quite a hard job. It's hard to mix up the dough in large amounts and it's hard to cook evenly, but society says their biscuits do need to be even. Within the fields of drinks processing, as you have things like instant coffee, how do you make instant coffee? How do you decaffeinate coffee? And that's a realm where we need to make things on a large scale. Energy, uh, lots of the methods of energy do involve transformation of molecules at some point in the process. And so I've included that on the types of product. In terms of process, what processes do we need to make those products? from the raw materials. We need to know about chemical synthesis, how we transform one molecule into another. We need to know about biosynthesis. This is where we persuade a biological organism to make our compound for us. And that's a big, important growth area. We often need our products to be obtained pure. So we need to know about chemical separations and biochemical separations. If our product is insulin, you make that by modifying E. coli bacteria. But a key part of the process is getting your insulin out of the E. coli bacteria before it has any um, value as a product at all. We need to know about processing of metals and polymers and foodstuffs because the properties of the final product depend on the processing. The properties of, say, ice cream depend on how you process it, because that affects the size of the fat globules and the size of the ice crystallites, and they affect the texture and the taste. And we need to know about converting energy from one form into another. And for a process and product to be useful, we need to work on the environmental aspects. So we are desperate for products and processes that don't damage the environment. We're desperate to use energy sensibly, efficient conversion so we don't waste any, wise use of conventional fuels, uh, increasing use of renewable energy. We're desperate to treat water properly, to treat waste streams properly, to do environmental cleanup operations. And this is all connected with the big issue of sustainability and within our undergraduate course we're quite keen on the question is what is the environmental cost of this product and the environmental cost of this process you'll have heard of some metrics like carbon footprint but that's not the only metric there are others and they hopefully will enable us to take decisions sensibly Our quality of life is affected by products, such as I've mentioned, made by processes on an industrial scale. Because they're made on a large scale, I, as an individual, have access to them. And some of these products I use every day. I use toothpaste every day. Some I might just use every couple of months. Maybe I 
fill my car with petrol every two months. Uh, most of the time I cycle around Cambridge because Cambridge is a good cycling city. Occasionally, maybe I'll, every 10 years or so, I may fall ill and need an antibiotic, but it is affecting the quality of people's lives. We need to think at different length scales in order to do chemical engineering. Sometimes we need to think at the molecular level, how molecules behave, how molecules interact. This is traditionally the realm of the chemist understanding this particular aspect. But we also, as well as the molecular level, we're going to need some understanding of the process level. How can we do particular transformations on a big scale? And in this slide, we may be taking cold fluid on the left in a pipe, put it through a pipe, and we want it to come out as hot fluid. And usually the cheapest way to do that is we take some steam and we condense it around the outside of the pipe so the steam comes out as condensed water. And you'll probably think, oh, we're going to need a big surface area of tube for that to happen. And so we design a pipe that goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And we put it in a, uh, a particular vessel that we then call a heat exchanger. Chemical engineers will also need to think at the plant level. How can we put different processes together? In this case, in a flow sheet arrangement, we might put a chemical reactor and a heat exchanger and a condenser and a compressor and an absorption column, things to do the reactions and the separations together. And the result, if it's a big plant to make tons and tons and tons of product, tends to be something that has a lot of pipes and a lot of columns. Occasionally we need to think at the product level because uh, that's a critical thing for our application. And on the left hand side of this slide, we have a whole lot of catalyst pellets of different sizes and different shapes for different applications. On the right hand side, we have chocolate where the properties of chocolate depend on the ingredients that went into it, but it also depends on its microstructure how we processed it, what uh, heating and cooling we did to the chocolate, tempering chocolate. There are um, six different crystalline phases of cocoa butter within chocolate. Each will give it a different melting point. And so if we want chocolate for a chocolate bar, we probably want phase five because that will melt nicely in your mouth. If you want chocolate for a magnum ice cream, you'd have a, a different phase, different heat treatment. And all the time, either at the back of our mind and sometimes at the front of our mind, we need to be thinking of the global issues, issues of energy, the environment and sustainability. So what do chemical engineers do? Well, if there's an existing process, Chemical engineers might be involved in operating it, uh, in troubleshooting it, and in improving it, maybe minimizing energy waste. Sometimes the process or the product do not exist. And in that case, chemical engineers need to do design. And design comes in two flavors. The first flavor of design is process design. Here we know what our product is. We just want to work out how to make it. Maybe the product I want to make is ethanol. Maybe I like ethanol. So I need to select how I'm going to make it. Shall I make it from hydration of ethene? Shall I make it by fermentation of sugar? Once I've chosen the route, I need to choose the process flow sheet and specify the necessary equipment. If there's a reaction to make ethanol, I need to work out what temperature it will be at, what pressure it will be at, what the flow rates in and out of the vessel will be, how many vessels should I have, 
How big should the vessels be? What should I make them out of? Issues like that. That's called specifying the equipment. And I will then need to consider the control of the process, the safety and the environmental aspects. The second flavour of design is product design. In product design, the attributes of the products are specified, but we don't necessarily really know what it is. And we need to choose or design a product to achieve that specification. So an example is shampoo. I know what shampoo is meant to do. It is meant to clean hair, leave it lustrous, shiny and bouncy, perhaps smell of strawberries, uh, perhaps uh, get rid of dandruff. If it could reduce uh, hair loss and balding, that might be an advantage and so on. But I haven't said what, what is in it. To clean hair, we probably need something that dissolves grease. We need a surfactant. Which surfactant should we choose? And in both cases of these types of design, we'll ultimately need to estimate the cost and the profitability of our design uh, because uh, these things will only happen if somebody thinks they're going to get a payback. So the types of knowledge chemical engineers need is a broad background understanding of pure science subjects. They need an understanding of chemistry and physics and biochemistry and material science and some general engineering principles and mathematics. And they need to be competent at using computers, doing IT and a basic knowledge of economics and health, safety, environmental issues. There are many other things they may need, but they need a key uh, understanding of these underlying topics. And they'll often need to put information from those topics together to solve maybe a particular design problem. So why study chemical engineering? Well, I think one main reason is an interesting discipline and it's useful to society. It has real world relevance. So the students acquire a wide variety of skills. There are lots of career opportunities within chemical engineering. Some of our graduates work as field engineers. They do get their hands dirty on chemical plants or, or in different parts of the world. Some end up in research projects. Maybe they're doing more bench scale experiments, improving a product or, or developing uh, a, a new type of small process. Uh, some go into management, hopefully after they've got some technical knowledge, so they're going to take wise decisions because they under, understand the process. Uh, there are in the chemical industry lots of multinational companies, so some people like them because they give them plenty of opportunity for travel. It is not a restrictive choice, there are lots of career opportunities outside the discipline. Uh, management consultants love people who are numerate and bright and can take information from different sources and propose a solution. And we are training people to do that, albeit in a design type environment. So all the surveys say chemical engineers are highly employable and that it is a financially rewarding discipline if you're interested in that aspect. So here are some generalizations. They always say you should avoid generalizations, including this one, uh, but I will make them anyway. Uh, scientists make discoveries and acquire knowledge. And lots of those discoveries will be useful in the real world, but scientists have pure curiosity. A chemist will love a particularly fascinating molecule at the bottom of a test tube because it is a fascinating molecule. It may be hideously expensive to make, it may blow up in air and have no practical uses, but it's still a fascinating molecule. Engineers, their focus tends to be on applying science to design and build things that are useful in the real world. They have a, a building a product focus. And it may be making engines or machines of the mechanical engineers, 
or structures if they're civil engineers or electrical equipment if they're electrical engineers in our case it's chemical or biochemical products is what we're making but historically many people have viewed chemical engineers and biochemical engineers to be at the interface between pure science and engineering because we have to have little bits of it so let's move on to how we teach it at Cambridge and the particular aspects of the Cambridge course now Cambridge for historical reasons is known throughout the world and it means we can attract excellent staff and it means we can attract excellent students uh, partly because of that it means when national newspapers or the complete university guide produces it lead tables you'll find Cambridge chemical engineering features at the top but more important reasons we have excellent facilities for teaching and research so those two pictures are new building on the West Cambridge site um, which is developed just for better teaching and research for chemical engineering and biotechnology we have a completely separate department to the rest of engineering in Cambridge we're a friendly department we have good staff uh, student interaction uh, there is our social area a tea room where students will chat with staff they will chat with me uh, a couple of students are on the panel they'll tell you a bit more about that later we've got an active student society who arrange some uh, work related events but they also arrange a lot of social events to develop a community spirit and again the students can tell you more about that later how does the course work well we have a very unusual structure for our course it's unusual for Cambridge and it is unusual for the rest of the country we designed our course to produce graduates that meet the needs of the process industries we have to give technical competence the employers expect chemical engineers to know what is a heat exchanger and roughly how to make it how to design it but we also have to teach personal and transferable skills because these are incredibly useful in the real world on our course we have an emphasis on the fundamental principles that underpin all processes and all products the laws of thermodynamics and fluid mechanics are the same regardless of whether you're working on making uh, methanol or working on making instant coffee and we've got an emphasis on modern chemical engineering and including many aspects of biotechnology um, because some of the old-fashioned chemical engineering is not quite so exciting um, what I sometimes say is rather than teaching people how to follow recipes which is what some engineering courses in the college in uh, the UK do we're trying to teach people how to write recipes because the laws of science and discoveries are going to change and there will be better ways of doing it and we hope the Cambridge graduates will not just be good chemical engineers in four years time we want them to be good chemical engineers in 40 years time so our emphasis is on the application of fundamental principles so our course is useful we know that the graduates tell us that the employers tell us that and we hope it's interesting so here's our structure in the first year we don't teach any direct chemical engineering at all instead we give students a choice just over half our students choose the first year natural sciences course at Cambridge so this is the standard Cambridge course that all scientists take and in the first year people choose three sciences from a list and they do some mathematics just under half our students do the first year general engineering course and that's got elements of general engineering and some mathematics and we have no preference on those two routes uh, I say those who have scientific curiosity are better off in the science route 
and those whose focus is on building things in the real world are better off in the engineering route. We then take those two cohorts and put them together in the second year at Cambridge, uh, confusingly called Chemical Engineering Part One. Here we introduce core chemical engineering. We teach a little bit of general engineering to those who did the natural science route. We teach a little bit of chemistry to those who did the engineering route, but by and large, we treat the two cohorts as the same. In the third year at Cambridge, we continue with core chemical engineering. What we think every chemical engineer needs to know, and that will include some aspects of biotechnology as well. And because the core elements have been covered, people can graduate at the end of three years with the standard Cambridge BA degree, Bachelor of Arts degree. The vast majority of our students stay on for year four in Cambridge as part of the integrated masters. This is more optional material and students can graduate at the end of that with a BA and a Master of Engineering degree. And that four year course is then accredited by the Institution of Chemical Engineers. And that means that if you work in industry as a graduate, you can get chartered engineer status without doing more examinations. We don't insist on vacation work in our course. It is not a compulsory element. Uh, we recommend it and to some extent we facilitate it. At the moment, most vacation work opportunities are between year three and year four of the course. That is the time where companies say, yes, you can solve our problems, you can save us money, and you might work for us uh, later on if we like you. There are opportunities in earlier years, in earlier vacations, but they are fewer and harder to get. How do we teach? Well, a lot of our teaching is by conventional lectures, and these may be in person or they may be delivered uh, remotely. As well as lectures, we have laboratory classes. And the amounts of laboratory classes vary depending on which year you're at in Cambridge. You get lots of lab classes in years one, slightly fewer in two, fewer in year three, and in year four, it depends on what research project you're doing. We also have project work. And the project work is assessed and sometimes as individuals it's done and sometimes it's done in small groups. And the amount of project work in Cambridge starts off small, but it grows each year in Cambridge. Effectively, as the lab work drops, the project work goes up. The Cambridge course is supported by the Cambridge Colleges. Uh, they look after the small group teaching so-called supervisions, and the colleges provide pastoral care and facilities. So they will provide a place to sleep, a place to eat, a place to study, and a place for particular hobbies. In many ways, they look after some of your real life aspects, such as you don't need to worry if your plumbing goes wrong, and instead all you need to worry about then is your work and your play. In your first year, I said you've got a choice of engineering or natural sciences. The engineering has got some mechanical engineering, some civil engineering, uh, some electrical engineering and some maths. Uh, in the science route, you get a choice of three sciences and some maths, and both of those have significant laboratory work. You'll be doing two or three labs a week. In the second year, when you do chemical engineering, we teach some fundamental chemical engineering principles, a little bit of process operations and process systems, uh, some enabling topics. The labs are down to one a fortnight, but we then have some assessed exercise as the lab work drops, including small design projects and some workshops. By the third year, we're building on the material. You get some more fundamental material 
So more operations and systems enabling topics, more assessed project work, and it culminates in a major design project at Easter term. Students are typically put in teams of five and they're told, please build a plant or design a plant that will make 50,000 tonnes a year of this product. Uh, the product varies each year. This year it was making butanol from wheat as the starting point. Uh, sometimes it's a petrochemical, sometimes it's an inorganic chemical. Uh, uh, once it was making instant coffee. That was a hard one. In the fourth year, you've covered all the core material and so it has a different flavour and it's at master's level now. There's a major research project. Hopefully you can discover something new, usually in pairs and helped by a member of academic staff. Uh, so you don't just reinvent the wheel. There are a couple of compulsory topics in part 2B on energy, sustainability, product design. But most of part 2B is optional topics. Some of them are depth, they go deeper into topics that you've covered earlier in the course. Others are breadth topics. There's something new that is useful to chemical engineers and biotechnologists in the real world. And because they're optional, you know, people will choose options that interest them. Some will go for the more mathematical options and some will avoid those. Some will go for the more uh, biotechnology options and some may avoid them depending on their interests. So the Cambridge course has close links with industry. So um, here are companies that are part of what we call our teaching consortium. They paid us a little bit of money uh, to be on this slide, but the reason they did so is threefold. Firstly, they help us with our teaching. If we need a seminar on how to manage projects in industry, I'm not the best person to do that because I've never managed a project in industry. Instead, we get an expert from one of these companies to do it. These companies also advise us on our course content. They tell us what we should teach. And sometimes we listen to them because they're employing our graduates. And sometimes we have better ideas than them because sometimes their ideas are a little old fashioned. These companies also come into the department and they say, come and work for us. And it's slightly different atmosphere to students saying, give us a job, give us a job, to these companies saying in, come into the department and they say, have a slice of pizza, please apply for us. They might not give you a job, but they're certainly desperate for your application. This is a pie chart of recent graduate employment. It's averaged over the last five years, and it is the, the first job that our students go into after graduating. And the top half of this pie is effectively the process industries. So just under half our students go and work in the process industries directly after graduating. But no particular process industry dominates. Some will go into the petrochemical sector, that is uh, about one eighth or one sixth of the pie. Some will go into pharmaceuticals, specialty chemicals, some food consumer goods, uh, utilities environment are water companies, power companies, engineering consultancy, manufacturing is that portion. Uh, some people like chemical engineering so much they stay to do more of it or stay on for higher degrees so we get uh, a significant portion of the pie stay on in education in some form to do research in some area. We do get a significant portion uh, run away and go and work in the city either in the financial sector or in a management consultancy sector. Uh, some of these are indirectly using their degree to help them in that. Um, some will work in say environmental consultancy or industrial consultancy and those are directly using aspects of their degree. And we've got everything else under the sun is hidden in this brown sector, other which will be uh, school teachers and computer programmers and everything else you can think of. 
Okay, that's come to the end of my uh, section of the talk. Uh, I will glance at the questions now, but I think what I will do is I'm going to hand over to my colleague Roisin, who's going to talk about the applying to Cambridge side, and I'll take questions on the uh, course content later on. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, over to you, Roisin. Good morning, everybody. Um, hello from Newnham College. Feels a bit like the Eurovision. Um, I'm sitting in a supervision room at Newnham College. Um, and today I have my admissions tutor hat on. So I'm one of the admissions tutors at uh, Newnham College. But I'm also a lecturer um, in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology. I'm more on the biotechnology side and indeed I teach the part one biotechnology course which you would do um, in, it will be your second year of your course, but your first year in our building when we take you on either through the engineering route or the natural sciences route. So I'm gonna run you quickly through the applications process and again, if you have questions, please put those into the Q&A box and we'll try and answer them either live or um, by writing. And do have a look at the ones that have already been answered because you might find that an answer to your question has already been put into the, um, into the Q&A box. Okay, so the process um, has a couple of steps. Um, the very first one should be choosing your course and presumably if you're here today it's because you're thinking about chemical engineering and I think Patrick has just given you some very good reasons to choose chemical engineering and biotechnology. Um, the second step is choosing a college and this seems to be a bit of a mystery to some people and they don't know how to do it and what to do and this year it's a bit different because you can't come in person and see the lovely colleges but um, there's lots of information and part of this virtual open um, day has been sessions from different colleges, including uh, from my own. Um, I've also seen lots of threads on social media where different students say why they choose a college, anything from because they give free ice cream to because they like the history of the college or a particular fellow is there. If you really can't choose, just put in open application and then you will be assigned a college, an algorithm does it. So um, that's how you choose college. Um, then the other thing we would stipulate is that you should really, really be careful of all of the deadlines. So make sure you're aware what the deadlines are and there are multiple deadlines. Um, so what you need to be aware of is that um, some courses, and chemical engineering is one of them, have pre-interview assessments. So you need to look and see when you should be registered by and to be aware of the fact that you're going to have to take those tests. The most important deadline is the UCAS application deadline, which is the 15th of October. And if you miss that, I'm afraid there's nothing you can do about it. So be sure not to miss that UCAS application deadline. Um, because at Cambridge we have um, a slightly more involved application process, we do ask for a supplementary application document, which is called the SAQ, Supplementary Applica Application Questionnaire, and the deadline for that is um, the 22nd of October. So you should look out for a link that will be sent, and you'll be asked to fill in a little bit more information that's um, relevant to Cambridge, such as, for example, a breakdown of what modules you took for A-level or your equivalent qualification. Um, and there's an opportunity here to uh, augment your personal statement. Um, this is quite useful if, for example, you're doing a, a UCAS application and you're thinking of applying for, say, um, chemistry at a different university, but you want to apply for natural sciences uh, or chem chemical engineering via natural sciences at Cambridge. And in the supplementary application um, questionnaire, there you can put something specific about the Cambridge course. So that's quite useful. Um, the next stage would be then um, doing the pre-admissions tests. And I'll explain that there are two types of tests depending on your route of entry. Um, and um, after that, you may be invited for interview. Um, so, the situation for interviews is not yet known. Um, it may be that these will be remote. You will be made aware of that soon. The, a decision will be made about whether those um, interviews will take place um, remotely or not. And then roughly in around January time, you should um, hear about a decision on your application. 
Okay, so what information do we use to assess applications? Um, and the answer is a lot of information um, and we take all kinds of things into account. So we take into account your previous academic record, which would include uh, GCSEs and predicted grades. We take into account your personal statement and that additional SAQ bit if you write it. We take into account what your teachers wrote about you. Um, and of course, the pre-interview assessment results are very important for us because they're a very good indicator of how you would do on the Cambridge course. Um, there's no written work uh, required for submission for chemical engineering. If there are extenuating circumstances, those are also taken into account. Everybody's going to have COVID-19 related extenuating circumstances and we're working on how to capture those specifically. Um, but this would be a place where you would talk, um, for example, about uh, disabilities or learning uh, problems uh, or anything that's occurred to you but we will have to take the COVID um, situation into account as well. And then if you're invited for interview, that's another piece of information that we have about your performance at interview. So it's a very holistic process. We take into account everything. It's not done on just one thing or another. So if you're trying to think what's the most important, the answer is it's all important. And we look at all of the information to make um, decisions. What are we looking for? So the main answer to this question is academic ability and potential. So it's great if you're a, a super sportswoman or a sportsman, but it won't help your chances of um, getting a, an interview at Cambridge. What we want to see is your ability to think and to um, solve problems really. And um, we also want to see a genuine subject uh, interest and that's often something that we probe in an interview. We want to see if you, if you care about um, chemical engineering. So um, most colleges would have a chemical engineer involved in the interviewing process and they will ask you about what you know about chemical engineering. So it's worth reading about that. And what we really care about ultimately is whether you're going to be suitable for a particular course and whether you will thrive. Um, so as Patrick mentioned, there are two routes to reading chemical engineering at Cambridge. So you can either choose to apply via natural sciences, and there's a specific UCAS co uh, code for that, or you can decide to apply via engineering and um, there's another UCAS code for that. And we consider that both of these routes provide equally good preparation. And um, indeed, the engineers who come in um, we brush up their chemistry and the uh, natural scientists who come in, we do some conversion material to make sure that they're, um, we do some engineering mathematics with them. So um, we, we consider that both routes are, are equal and, and either is good. Um, but what I would say and what I would stress is that there's a lot of flexibility and I'll talk about that uh, in a moment. So the course requirements are slightly different depending on whether you're doing chemical engineering via natural sciences or via engineering. So in um, the natural sciences case, we, um, we require maths and chemistry. So those are essential. And we would really like you to have done either further maths or physics, but we know that some schools don't offer further maths. So those are not essential. Um, and then for the engineering route, what is essential is maths, chemistry and physics. And again, the further maths is highly desirable. It's just because um, it would be very difficult to carry out the engineering course if you don't, you would really struggle. Um, so if you don't have further maths, it's worth maybe contacting the college you're interested in applying to and just discussing your situation. And maybe there would be an opportunity to do some further study, some further self-study. So flexibility. So this is one of the best things about um, the Cambridge course, which is that you can change your mind after the first year. So if sadly you decided not to continue with uh, chemical engineering, you can continue with engineering if you've um, come in via that route, or you could continue with natural sciences if you've come in via that route. If also you came in as a natural scientist without having really thought about chemical engineering, you can also switch in and the same is true for engineering. So a lot of flexibility. Um, 
There may be a slight advantage in applying with the chemical engineering UCAS codes though, because it means that there will probably be, as I said, a chemical engineer during the interview. And it would also give you a priority if there's a lot of competition for chemical engineering that year, you would have priority over the people who want to transfer in. Okay, um, as Patrick mentioned, um, applications are handled by colleges and I've already given you some insight into how you might choose a college. I believe there are 31 different colleges and all of them, apart from the graduate ones, um, where they're graduate only, they admit chemical engineers. And again, how you choose a college is up to you. It can just be about personal preference. And if you really can't choose, then you should just leave your application open. So I, I encourage you to look at student forums, to look on social media, to look on the college's websites, and you will, you'll find some information about how you could choose your college. Um, regardless of the college that you choose, your lectures and exams will all be the same because the university handles lectures and exams. Um, it's the supervisions that would be handled by the colleges and as Patrick mentioned, the roof over your head and, and the food that you eat um, is the provision um, of the college. So, uh, in terms of applications, if you are a UK or an EU applicant, you need to submit your UCAS form by mid-October, so 15th of October. If you're an overseas applicant, depending on where you're from, there may be slightly different deadlines, so make sure you are aware of those. This information is all available on the um, University of Cambridge website. Um, again, I cannot stress enough, if you, if you miss those deadlines, there's nothing really we can do about it. Um, for the pre-interview assessments, those are also required. They're usually um, taken at an authorised centre and you should choose either the natural sciences pre-interview assessment or the engineering one, depending on the course that you choose. Um, and um, I would really strongly advise that you look online and look at the uh, past papers and attempt to work your way through some of that material. It's, it's based on sort of GCSE level knowledge, but going a bit more into detail just to see how you think and how you um, solve problems. Um, okay. And then, of course, um, there's the SAQ that you should uh, submit, and the deadline for that is the 22nd of October. So, um, how do you know then if you'll be successful at the next stage? So, the college will contact you if you um, are to be interviewed, and I would say roughly 75% of the applicants that we receive are interviewed. And again, the information on whether that will happen in person or remotely should um, be available to you soon. Generally what happens is you have two interviews, although this will depend on the college, um, and one of those interviews is likely to have a uh, chemical engineer um, in, in the room, while the other may be more uh, of a, either natural science or an engineering interview, depending on which route that you took. Um, it's often technical questions. What we recommend is that you should do your thinking out loud. Um, you should also take the hints that you're being given. So what we want is not to see you fail at a question. We want to see how you work through a question and whether you accept guidance and you're willing to, to take hints about how you should try and solve the, the problems that are um, being set. Um, we want to to make sure that you're going to thrive in the Cambridge course. And one of the things we sometimes say is that um, an interview is meant to um, be a bit like one of the supervisions. So the supervision is um, the Cambridge small group teaching where you're with a fellow or a PhD student or a postdoc who's working on a particular part of a subject with you. And, and it's one of the really nice parts of the Cambridge course. And we really want to make sure that you can thrive. If you're um, having, if, if you're worried or anxious about the interview process, one of the best things you can do is to look at the videos of interviews that have been prepared and are online, um, and and look at the official Cambridge um, 
videos and don't get freaked out about other websites that, that, that tell you all kinds of crazy stories about interviews. Look at the official videos and I hope that will be reassuring to you. So after your application has gone through, um, there are three possible outcomes. Um, if you've been interviewed, um, you may get an offer from the interviewing college. The standard offer um, is for A-level grades, two A stars and an A. If you've done some other kind of a qualification, you can look at the equivalent um, requirements uh, for those other qualifications online. Um, the other thing that can happen is that the college has had lots of great applicants that year and they just have too many, but they still think you have a great chance of getting an offer at Cambridge. And so what we do is we pool those applicants and they go into what's called the winter pool. So in January, the colleges look around and there might be another college that has a shortfall of great applicants in the chemical engineering field. And they'll look in that pool and they'll fish you out and they'll make you an offer. Um, so that's the second thing that can happen. The third thing that can happen is that unfortunately you don't get an offer and you're not placed in the pool. Um, you shouldn't feel too badly about this. It's generally an assessment made about the fact that you just wouldn't thrive at Cambridge and that you do really, really well somewhere else. Okay, if you need more information, there's um, plenty of information available on the university website. You can also look at the individual college websites. Um, some of you who may have very specific admissions questions or worries about an individual situation, really the best um, advice I can give you is to get in touch with the college that you're thinking of applying to and asking the admissions officers. They're all very, very helpful and willing to answer queries. If you can't really decide which college to apply to, then please send your query to our admissions team. The email is here on this slide and we will attempt to answer those questions as best we can. We can answer some of those questions today. Some of them we may need to come back to you if it's a very specific one. So um, that's it from me now. I will hand over to Lisa. Thank you, Roisin. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to hand straight over to our two students, Helen and uh, Nikki. Hello, thank you. Uh, I'm Helen Scafield, and I have just completed my fourth year here at CEB. And for this segment of the webinar, I'm just going to talk about a couple of the academic highlights for each of the years of the chemical engineering degree at Cambridge. So once you've completed your first year of either engineering or natural sciences, you move to CEB at the start of your second year. Alongside the labs, uh, alongside the lectures and supervisions, you also complete teaching laboratories. These are lab scale experiments which focus on the topics of fluid mechanics and transport processes, which are imperative to any chemical engineer's remit. For me, these labs were a great difference from the lectures and helped to reiterate that theoretical knowledge in a practical sense. Additionally, you complete exercises. These are broad and sometimes open-ended engineering problems, which require you to combine lots of different aspects of the course Alongside this, you tend to use your computer programming skills and get to know different simulation softwares, which you might find when you go out into industry later on. This accumulates at the end of year two in producing a design project of a one piece of process equipment. For me, this was to design a shell and tube heat exchanger to meet a certain required duty. Exercises continue into your third year and you also complete the design project. This is a five week full time project where you work in a group of around five students to complete the conceptual and process design of a modern industrial process. Within this, you're given a certain area of the process to design from scratch. So that really is starting with the basic calculations, energy and mass balances to then deciding what pieces of equipment you might want, how you're going to lay them out, how many you're going to have. Um, and additionally, you're then given a specialism 
for your whole group project. So that might be that you're in charge of the safety or you're the plant economist and you work with your group to work all those values out for the whole process. The design project was a really rewarding experience and was a much more hands-on approach to an engineering problem. And it showed how you had to work within your team to be able to, at the end, present and write up your project. As you move into fourth year, you start to get a lot more lecture choice, which means you can look into individual aspects of chemical engineering in a lot more detail. You're also able to broaden your skill set through the study of a foreign language or even complete an entrepreneurship course. I saw that someone had asked about nanotechnology. So within one of, one of the lecture modules that you can complete in this is on bio nanotechnology. And I'll talk a bit in a minute about a research project which looks into this. Um, the research project is a major aspect of fourth year. It's a seven month long project which enables you to delve deeper into one particular um, area of interest that you might have. Uh, for me, the research project was probably my academic highlight of the whole degree. Um, I, the, because CEB is such a research diverse department, that means that you really can complete your research project in a wide range of different areas. So in my year alone, projects range from purely computational, um, people that looked at machine learning based image restoration, to projects which were purely experimental and looked at the combustion of glycerol in a fluidized bed. To give you a quick example, uh, my project that I completed this year looked at using a chemical known as polydopamine to manufacture nanoparticles. So I've given you a, an electron microscope image that my project partner and I took of a couple of the nanoparticles that we produced. We were particularly interested in getting a porous structure of the nanoparticles so that we could look at whether a drug could be encapsulated within and then they could be used to target certain cell lines. Within the research project, you also produce and present a research project poster and finally write up your project as a journal style paper. The research project is a really different um, experience to the rest of your degree and it also gives you an idea of what work into research and development or a PhD might entail if that's something that's of interest to you. However, CEB is not only about the academics, it's also quite a social department. Um, it is relatively small, but that means that you really do get to know that all the rest of your peers on your course across all the different Cambridge colleges, and you get to know staff on an individual basis. It's quite a brand new department, which means the facilities are a great place to work, but also at the centre of the department, as Patrick mentioned, there's this large open space tea room. They even schedule tea breaks into your morning lectures, which makes it a perfect time to just part with work and go and spend time with some friends. Additionally, within the department, there's social groups uh, and activities which you can get involved with. And there is the student-led undergraduate Cambridge University Chemical Engineering Society, or QCES, who arrange lots of socials and annual dinners. And they also arrange careers events and talks. So they can help you then prepare for life after university or get some replacements between different years if that's what you want to do. Overall, I can say that I really enjoyed my time at CEB and I highly recommend it to anyone with an interest in studying chemical engineering. Uh, now I'm going to pass on to Nikki, who's going to talk more about the college life side of Cambridge. Um, hi everyone, I'm Nikki. I'm a second year from Moreland College and I'll be highlighting the aspects of life at Collegiate Cambridge. So being a Cambridge student is a very unique experience, mostly due to the collegiate system. You feel part of a strong community made up of such different people, but who all really love whatever it is they do. What makes it special is how quickly it becomes home for so many people 
and I'm sure several colleges would have prepared a virtual open day information session for you. So along with all of your labs, lectures and projects which Helen touched on, you'll also have supervisions which are small group teaching sessions which are organised by the college. And these supervisions really do help you and allow you to grow academically by giving you time to reflect on material covered in the department. There's also several different activities and societies, both within college and outside of college. So for example, in the department, we have QCAS, which is the Chemical Engineering Society, which Helen talked about. And this simply allows you to meet different people from different colleges, different year groups, which creates a support network within the department. Outside the departments, there's also several different societies to get involved, ranging from sports, music, drama, or cultural ones, which allow you to meet people that share the same interest. Since societies such as sports ones are collegiate as well as university-wide, it means you can take part at literally any level, from beginner to representing the university to everywhere in between. There's also several traditions and fun things to do. For example, Bridgemas, the Cambridge Christmas that happens on the 25th of November, or formals, which are formal dinners that you can go with your friends, or even May balls, which are black tie events at the end of Easter term. And unofficial traditions like this really add to the charm of studying here and are part of what made Cambridge distinctive. Finally, I absolutely fell in love with the city. Most colleges are fairly close together, which really does give it a friendly student atmosphere. And however you choose to spend your time here or whatever college you end up choosing, you will most certainly enjoy this unique experience. Um, thank you and I will pass it on back to Lisa. Thank you very much Nikki and Helen and thank you uh, uh, everyone. Uh, I hope all of you have uh, got a flavour of what it's like to come and study chemical engineering with us in Cambridge. I can see that the questions are, um, are running in and uh, that uh, it looks as if Patrick is going to be very busy uh, answering uh, many of them. So let, let's start with the ones on the coming in via the engineering or natural sciences route, because there are uh, several of them. Patrick. Oh, oh. Okay, um, let's see. Um, so there's a question on which modules, if you apply via the science route, which modules sh should you take in your first year? And we leave it entirely down to the student. So the ones most commonly taken in first year students are chemistry, uh, physics is the next most after chemistry, uh, material science then follows, then biology of cells and then earth sciences. Uh, now all those subjects are useful in some parts of chemical engineering and we know you can't do all of those modules, you just do three of them and maths. So the more biological people tend to do biology of cells, and chemistry and one other. Uh, occasionally we get people who do physiology of organisms which is less directly useful but people do come into our course having done it. Uh, the people who do earth sciences that can be great training. The, the world is actually desperate for uh, some geologists who understand chemical engineering or chemical engineers who understand geology or at least the fossil fuel part of the world is desperate for, for people who do that. Um, but it's so that that bit is entirely uh, up to you on which modules you do. You don't do all, all the sciences in your, your first year, you just do three sciences from a list. Uh, do natural sciences students have the option to enter chemical engineering in the second year and how many choose to do so? So we have some flexibility in our course in the sense that Cambridge deliberately has very broad courses in year one and we specialise in years gradually in years two, three and, and four if it applies. So all the scientists don't even choose which science they're doing in year one and Cambridge thinks this is a good idea because people in year 12, year 13, they don't actually know what university science is like and it seems a bit odd that they have to commit themselves at some university to a subject that they they haven't studied. 
So we have flexibility. People do often come in with the intention of doing one science and change to another one. Uh, typically of the people who end up doing chemical engineering, about 80% knew they were going to do chemical engineering when they were admitted. Another 20% of people who didn't know, but have maybe changed into it, maybe after falling out of love with physics or falling out of love with some other bit of engineering. Um, but we also have the possibility of people admitted to us if they do fall in love with chemistry or earth sciences or another bit of engineering, that flexibility to change is permitted. It just needs college permission and colleges usually just say, do whatever the student wants because what a student wants to do is usually the important thing. I think I've done that one. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Patrick. Um, we have uh, a, a, a question. Uh, why is it many colleges don't accept any chemical engineers for an academic year? Is it that students for chemical engineering often apply to either engineering or natural sciences without specifying chemical engineering? Rasheen, do you have a, a, a any input on, on colleges accepting people for chemical engineering? Um, so I was looking at that question and trying to understand exactly what was meant. I presume that, that they mean why does the first year occur? Why are you applying to natural sciences or engineering? But I suppose it's because we consider that that preparation material is excellent um, preparation for our course. And um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if Patrick has more to add to that. Um, the only other comment I would make is, so typically we have, uh, we might get 60 students in a year of chemical engineering and they're divided up among about 30 colleges. And sometimes you'll find a college will have six chemical engineers in a year. And sometimes you'll find a college has zero chemical engineers in that year. Um, because uh, the colleges are desperate to admit the people who will do well on the course. And if they happen not to get any who, who look good when they uh, consider the applications, they may not panic at getting none in that year. They may well fish some out of the winter pool and offer them a place that way, but they might not uh, worry too much about it. Uh, they'll worry about it on a long time if they never admit it any, because they wouldn't want to do that. Um, so you do occasionally find just on low numbers per college natural statistical fluctuations that occasionally a college won't have any in that particular year group. Uh, but they're not at a big disadvantage because uh, they'll have in their first year they'll know lots of scientists and lots of engineers as, as well as other human beings in the college doing other subjects and the community feel within the department is such they don't actually feel at any disadvantage. Um, and the students can comment on whether they community feel if you want, if you like. Yeah, you definitely have a community feel within your college. It, it basically becomes your home away from home. Um, and you really do get to know all the people because each college might have up to say 100, 150, like on average students in a year. So you get to know all the people who you joined with really nicely and over a wide range of subjects. So I definitely feel like Cambridge with the collegiate system has a more family feel than many of the universities would be. So, um, Helen, Nikki, let's see what your view is on, on this question. What materials or books can be helpful to prepare for interviews? Um, so one thing I found really useful for interviews was a website known as IWantStudyEngineering.org. So this website has lots of practice questions and questions which make you delve deeper into thoughts than maybe typical A-level questions would do, and it provides solutions. One thing I would suggest when you do the questions is to practice saying out loud what you're thinking, because for me, I was too used to A-level just writing down my answers. Um, and you don't want it to feel alien in the interview having to explain exactly what you're doing. 
So what, even whether you've got friends that are doing similar subjects or applying to similar subjects at different universities, just practice doing it with those and explaining what you're doing. Um, one book I read before coming was the book suggested by Patrick, the Salon book, um, the introduction to chemical engineering, because that was quite useful, just to give a bit of information about what chemical engineering actually is. I don't know whether Nikki used anything else. Um, yeah, no, I think Helen covered most of it. I did exactly the same thing when I had my interview. Thanks, Nikki. So uh, but both of you, the two, there's a, a bit of a more detailed question on, on reading material. And Patrick, do uh, chip in as well. Are there any specific recommendations in reading material, such as books and other pieces of literature, that would prove beneficial to read before starting the course? I've come across the works of such uh, Henry Kister in the past and fascinated by the prospects of simply widening my knowledge and wanted to know if there are any specific pieces of research that may be specifically beneficial to this course. Um, I think I answered a similar query by, by text uh, and there's two elements to it. There's the, the what is chemical engineering and showing an interest and motivation and, and the book by Solon and Harb uh, just mentioned is perfectly reasonable for that. But in terms of general reading, uh, the advice is if you read anything that's general science or general engineering, it's useful general knowledge background and you can uh, use that as evidence of motivation for the subject and interest in the area. And so I, I wouldn't be too specific on trying to find out about particular areas about chemical engineering or indeed biotechnology because not many of the books are at the right level. So read the general science and the general engineering books that are aimed at your level or between bridging the gap between uh, school and university. Uh, and they're the good ones I would suggest. Uh, Helen, Nikki, did you do any work placements during the summer? We have a question, does chemical engineering department help students in attaining any work placements during the summer? Is there any option to complete a year in industry? Uh, Patrick, you, you touched on this in, in your uh, presentation uh, uh, and uh, uh, in terms of the year in industry, we don't run a, uh, a, a sandwich course of, of, that, of that form. Helen, Nikki, what's your what's been your experience of um, internships and placements in in your summer vacations? Yeah, so I've been lucky enough to get a placement after each of my years of university, um, and I've done them in different things. So I tried to get them so that I could get a taste of consultancy, and then I had a taste of research and development, and my final one was on a big uh, industrial plant instead. The department runs lots of careers events and talks that QCARES organise. So you can talk to different companies that come in. There's also the university as a whole have a career service who do science and technology open days where loads of different companies come in. And you can just talk to them, get contact details and send your CV. I'd say it's more difficult in the early years because you haven't got the knowledge yet that some of the companies want. Um, and so the first, after my first year, my first company was quite a small company near to where I live. And it was just that I had a friend whose parents worked there and they said, oh, do you fancy doing this? Um, so I think initially in my first year, it tends to be smaller companies and then you start to get bigger companies as you go through. Nikki, what's been your experience? Um, so I had a consultancy one last year and I'm about to start next week. I start my, inter my virtual internship in a oil and gas company. So I've been quite lucky to get them both years as well. Um, but QCARES does hold like loads of career events during term time, which is quite useful to like network and meet people from the industry. Um, so yeah. There's loads of resources available during term time that do help you get those internships. Thank you. Rasheen, perhaps you could give some advice on the pool 
uh, and if you're put in the pool, will you be called for an interview at another college before being offered a place? Will you get a chance to look around the other college before accepting the place? So the answer to that is that it's very, very rare to be called for an interview at a second college. And there's usually a very good reason for it because maybe there's a piece of information missing, but it's very rare. Um, so the, the pool was put in place to make things fairer across all colleges. So you can imagine a situation Patrick alluded to earlier where a college one year gets 15 stellar applicants for chemical engineering, but they really only have 12 places. Places in colleges are usually dictated by how many bedrooms they have. And the, the people in charge usually say, you know, there's a hard limit. We literally can't fit any more people into the building. And you have to balance across all subjects, of course. So what the pool puts in place is a method for equilibration ac across the colleges. And um, generally in the pool, you see these frantic admissions tutors fishing around looking for great candidates and they'll be asking advice from colleagues saying, you know, did you have some great candidates this year? And then that's how we ensure that there's fairness across all colleges and that the best applicants come. And let's stay with you uh, for, for a bit. Uh, when applying to chemical engineering through natural sciences, would one interview be physics based and one interview be chemistry based? So generally, and I can only really um, state how it happens in my college because I know how it's done, but I think that's a general principle across colleges. When you apply and you've put chemical engineering, so it's natural sciences via chemical engineering, we try and have at least one chemical engineering interview, which may be a little bit of chemistry, a little bit of maths, you know, chemical engineering specific stuff. And then either one chemistry or a physics interview. And we really try very hard. So if you've never done physics, we won't be giving you a physics interview. So people sometimes get a bit panicked about that. You know, how do I know what I'll be interviewed on? But we really try and make sure that we tailor the interviews based on your subjects. Okay, thank you. Um, Patrick, you have uh, indicated qu uh, quite a few questions that you would like to answer. So can I hand back to you to, to uh, go through some of those questions, please? Okay, there's a, there's a few general themes. Uh, one student doing the International Baccalaureate says, is it beneficial to do four higher levels and get the minimum requirement or do three higher levels? And, and get above and we're occasionally asked should I do four A levels or should I do um, three A levels and the answer is that there isn't a general answer okay so it's down to the individual so uh, the Cambridge colleges want to admit the people who would do best and the more you do and excel in is obviously good so if you can do four A levels or four high levels that is obviously good it's showing knowledge and excellence however we do want you to excel in the modules you're doing and we do want you to remain a human being uh, to have a life and uh, so you should do as as much work that is relevant in terms of qualifications as you feel able to and still excel while still having a life and you may have to discuss that with parents or teachers to work out what the balance is for you a lot of our applicants are doing four A levels because of the further maths A level component, but every year some are getting in with just three. Uh, so there isn't a general answer to your question on that one, but there is, there's an answer to how to think about it without there being particular personal advice. And you'll find an individual who'll say, yes, we'll far rather have three, brilliant, and another person in Cambridge will say, we'll rather have five, a bit less brilliant. Um, one comment that's come up is for the people applying, how do they write their personal statement? Do they write about nat chemical engineering on it or do they write about, say, natural science or, or general engineering? In that case, my usual advice for personal statements is it is the same statement that is seen by all the universities you're applying to on UCAS. So I tend to recommend 
you write to your personal statement on the topics of the other courses you're applying to rather than the Cambridge course because our structure is unique nobody else does our structure so if you're applying to lots of chemistry courses write about chemistry if you're writing lots about chemical engineering courses write about chemical engineering and then we send a supplementary application questionnaire that you do online one week after the other deadline and that's Cambridge specific and so you can then write about why you chose the particular Cambridge topic that you did. Uh, so that's my advice there, like the UCAS statement, personal statement, course specific on the other topics and put the SAQ co comments on the Cambridge one. A number of people have asked about further maths. Uh, many schools don't offer further maths, they can't teach it and it's a particular problem with pandemic situations. Uh, further maths is uh, highly desirable to know some further maths. If you don't do any further maths, it's not a crisis. We do admit people without further maths, but they've got to prove that they're really good at maths. They've got to prove they would have been good at further maths if they did it, if I could put it that way, uh, particularly via the engineering route. If your school doesn't offer further maths, um, I tend to recommend students, if they're able, to look at what is called the Advanced Maths Support Programme. You'll have to Google Advanced Maths Support Programme. And they offer resources, videos and so on, to help students do further maths modules that aren't taught by their school. And you can indeed, and they give you help on learning further maths modules that aren't taught by your school. And then you can decide whether you get assessed on them or not. Uh, your school could enter you for say AS yes, further maths if you did enough of them. Uh, but you can write about them on your SAQ and say, yeah, I've self-taught myself module M3. Um, so uh, you do as much as you can while still excelling and being a human being. Uh, and should you do anything to prepare for the SAQ? Uh, no, uh, the SAQ is just a supplementary questionnaire. You just write a few extra bits on it. One of the things we find useful is you tell us what you've studied because we may adjust our interview questions based on which modules you've studied. The order you studied them in is sometimes different from student to student. Uh, that's why we have it. I'll now uh, pass over to uh, Rosine for another question. Um, so, I saw that there was a question about academic support and I think um, something we haven't really talked about is the director of studies. So the director of studies is in a s essence the liaison between the department and the college. So usually the director of studies um, for chemical engineering in a college is um, it's usually an academic member of staff who's a fellow of the college and you'll be assigned a director of studies um, it can be the same person for all four years or it can be a different person um, generally what happens is um, you'll be assigned somebody in the first year who might be um, a natural sciences person if you're doing it via that route but um, you can also talk to the chemical engineering fellow at the college and um, they're a really good source of academic support you can talk to them about mm -hmm. the the modules you want to take, you can talk to them about changes in your course, you can talk to them about queries um, or academic related um, questions that you might have. I also want to mention that there is support that's not academic support and so you'll be assigned a tutor and your tutor is somebody who helps you with everything that's not academic, so pastoral support and that's usually somebody who's not in your subject who you can go to if you have financial difficulties or health issues or anything like that. So there is a large amount of support um, provided at Cambridge. Um, essentially with everybody has the goal of making sure that you excel and thrive uh, in your course here. Okay, so Helen, Nikki, I'm going to come to you uh, both again and ask you for what your view is on the percentage of chemical engineering uh, 
of physics, well, the percentage of physics, maths, and chemistry in chemical engineering. Uh, and uh, also whether there is, there are more modules related to general engineering and mathematics than chemistry. Yeah, so one thing to get clear is that the, the chemistry aspect isn't organic or inorganic chemistry. It's essentially, you use mainly the physical chemistry or the, the chemistry side of it is less the side of your mechanisms you might be drawing at A-level. Um, so a lot of the chemical engineering degree is the ap application of the maths and the physics and the chemistry to a certain problem. Um, and you start to realise, especially when you get to fourth year, it's a lot about balances and looking at a problem. And then just, you will hear the terms mass and energy balance an awful lot throughout your whole degree. Um, and a lot of that is your physics and your maths combined and a bit of chemistry. And the chemistry knowledge is just, this is what reactions occurring or this is what transformations occurring. And then it's knowledge of moles, mass and things like that which you then apply in a more physics and math sense. So it's hard to put a specific percentage on it, um, but it definitely includes all of them, but you don't get the pure chemistry that you would get if you were doing a chemistry degree. I don't know if Nikki's got anything else to add to that. <laughs> so Patrick, back to you. Uh, is it useful to do work experience before you start the course? Um, yes, it is useful to do relevant work experience if you're able to. Um, however, don't be put off if you can't do it because the majority of applicants for chemical engineering course do not have any relevant work experience at all. If you do get the chance, and it may be uh, just as simple as shadowing somebody rather than actually working another company then do take the opportunity. Um, we mentioned the year in industry earlier. Uh, some students do the year in industry scheme before they start university. We don't have a sandwich year off but we do allow students to defer entry year and every year some students take a year in industry before they start in that way. Certainly not essential it's still a minority of students do it that way. I'll take another question. Where should I go? Where should I go next? Uh, so how about international students? Uh, what counts for further maths for international students? Um, so whole realm of different international systems. Um, we know further maths doesn't exist in many of them. All we need to do is check you're good at maths and we'll do well on the course, i.e. You would have done well on further maths if it had existed. Obviously, you can study more maths modules yourself if you want to, um, but we're just aware of it and we'll, we'll, we take that into account when we weigh up your classes and strong points on the admissions process. And is C1 enough to apply to this course? I'll need to know which uh, country C1 is. Uh, if C1 means compulsory module one for maths, then most people have a lot more than that. If C1 is referring to uh, the chemistry A levels in Singapore, then it's a completely different answer. Okay. Um... There's a question about supervisions. Um, so I can start and then maybe Helen and Nikki can finish. Uh, so a supervision is a small group teaching um, that you find at Cambridge um, that will supplement your um, lectures. And generally, there are about three students with a supervisor. Um, quite often, you'll be given some problems to work through, and um, you do that in advance of the supervision, and then during the supervision, you can work through the problems. So maybe, Helen, can you supplement that answer? Yep. Yeah. Supervisions are very useful because it's the moment that you can delve deeper into any of your problems. Because I found that university was a lot different to school. 
where your lectures, you're just gaining the information and the, the skills, and then your supervision is going through those. Um, I'd also say the supervisions, you can often tailor them to what you want them to be, and your supervisors are very flexible. So it might be that you want to go through the notes in particular on certain bits. Um, and I'm sure if you'd ask them, they would do that rather than just going through the questions. They're all also always very helpful. If you anything that you think is small, don't be afraid to ask it. Just ask, even if you think it's a stupid question, um, because they've probably certainly heard the same or worse before. Um, and I, yeah, so I'd say make the most out of them. I think at the start in my first year, I was really nervous in supervisions, but then I found as the years went on, just to ask anything that came into my head because it was the best way to solve any problems and make sure that I did well in the end and fully understood what was going on. I think the supervision system is the most magnificent place to be given permission to ask a silly question because you usually find it isn't silly at all. And, it, and, it, and it's, it's marvellous because you can just delve into anything. Uh, Rasheen, if you have taken four A-levels, does that alter entry requirements? Um, so the answer is uh, no, it doesn't. <laughs> um, and something I wanted to specify here is that if your uh, offer is two A-stars and an A, and you get um, an A star in English. <laughs> I don't know, maybe you wouldn't be studying English. But that will not meet the requirements for your two A stars and A. So it's, it generally has to be sciences and maths and that should be clearly uh, stipulated. It's great to do, four A, to do four A levels if you can. And as um, Patrick has said, it's just making things slightly easier for you in your first year, but you don't have to. And if it's a bit of a stretch, maybe um, you, it's advisable not to, to do the four A levels and just do three. And then we seem to have just one question uh, left. Uh, so if anybody has any further questions, please put them in now. Patrick, um, what are the statistics? So there's a question, what are the statistics for international graduate employment? Uh, the short answer is I don't know, I only know overall uh, values where 90% of our graduates report that they have a job within six months. Um, the other 10% are often travelling the world rather than looking for jobs. Um, and the question continues, what proportion uh, continue to study work in the UK for international students? And I don't know the answer, so I'm going to ask Helen on her, her class whether she actually has any idea on her overseas students, how many have jobs, because it, it happens both ways. Yes, so a lot of my year have jobs, a lot of my friends have jobs, and have still got jobs at the minute, which is good. Um, I would say there is a definite mixture in the international students. Um, quite a few of them, quite a few of my friends have said they want to do at least a couple of years in the UK and then they might go back after that. Um, but mainly like the big companies, you, I mean specifically I'm thinking of big oil and gas companies for example, have, um, are all over the world. So a lot of the international students have applied to them and might do a couple of years in the UK or if they're from Malaysia, go and do start in Malaysia and then work somewhere else. Um, but I'd also say quite a few international students have done PhDs or are staying on, either at Cambridge or going elsewhere to do a PhD. So there is certainly a mixture between everyone. A question's just cropped up on what is the earning potential of a chemical engineer? Uh, it does vary sector to sector. Um, last year the Institute of Chemical Engineers did a salary survey and the, um, the median salary for first jobs of those who responded uh, was 30.1 thousand. Um, and now I know some people are starting on 37 thousand. Um, 30 thousand sounds like an awful lot of money as a first job to me. Uh, so there were some who were earning more than that and there were obviously some who were earning significantly less than that. And 
what the degree does is get you your first job. How you do after that depends on how good you are. Uh, the Cambridge name or the degree doesn't actually help you. It's how well you're doing on that. There are certainly some uh, chemical companies that promote and, and, and pay well better than all the survey says the other forms of engineer or, or pure scientists. Um, another question that's come up is in IB high level maths chemistry English with standard level physics sufficient? Uh, well yes it is sufficient for chemical engineering via the natural science route. Uh, people do get in with that. Um, exactly that. Make sure you're comfortable with the mechanics type things if you can because the IB has a bit less mechanics in maths and you'll only be doing standard level physics uh, so you just need to be aware you might get asked questions on mechanics type things at interview because they want to check you can do them but people do get in with just standard level physics for the IB. Okay well if nobody has any further questions uh, I'd just like to remind you that the, uh, the recording is available so that you can go back and uh, listen again in case you missed anything. It will be emailed out to all the attendees next week. Uh, so just one final opportunity for anyone to put in any final question. And I'll just go round the panel. Patrick, anything final that you would like to say? Um, no, I hope we've uh, uh, answered the questions and you've got some idea of what Cambridge is like and, and our course is like. And good luck with your applications and, and good luck wherever you end up being. Helen? Yeah, I would say my advice is just to go for it. You never know what's going to happen. I didn't think that I would get in when I applied and I'm sat here at the end of my four year degree. I mean, thankfully got the degree uh, sometime this week. So uh, yeah, I just say go for it. Good luck with the application and good luck with the interview. Nikki. Yeah, no, good luck everyone with your application. And I think I'd say what Helen said and just go for it. Like, I didn't know I wanted to apply until coming to the open day. And then after coming to Cambridge, coming to the department, that was the moment when I was like, oh, I do need to give this a shot. Um, so yeah, good luck. Rasheen. Yes, uh, I wanted to advise everybody to make sure they ask lots of questions to the admissions officers of the various colleges. They're very willing to answer any questions you have about specific uh, entry requirements, etc. And then a second plea, which is we read a lot of personal statements and the genuine motivated ones really shine out. So do just write it about your own experience about why you want to do chemical engineering. Thank you very much. So I think that brings us to the end. Uh, thank you for joining our virtual open day. I wish you great luck with your, your applications. Uh, and I would just like to finish by saying again, what an exciting department chemical engineering and biotechnology is. We are engineering from the single molecule scale right up to a big petrochemical plant and it gives you such a broad insight into the fundamentals that you need to create the technologies that are going to be essential for the world tomorrow. So thank you all and good luck.